Yo! Welcome to a very special episode of Gaming with Mr. C. Guys, today we have a <laughs> mashup episode with Graveyard Gaming, a podcast, a gaming podcast over at Spotify and Anchor, and we decided to team up for a very special extended edition director's cut special mashup episode never done before. I don't know, maybe it has been, but a very special episode nonetheless, where we talk about the history of skateboarding in video games, more specifically over the last 20 years. Now, you can go listen to the podcast, again, over at Anchor or SoundCloud, Graveyard Gaming, link description and below, but if you wanted to watch it with some special clips from the games that we talk about, just stay right here. Let's roll. Well, first off, man, I appreciate this mashup episode. Uh, you ready to talk about some skateboarding? I absolutely am. As you know, uh, skateboarding today isn't what it always was. It, today, it's part of the Olympics. It's, it's a part of the fabric of society. But growing up in the 80s and 90s, it wasn't always a part of mainstream society. Have you ever heard of art imitating life? Well, gaming is an art form, right? If you don't believe me, Graveyard Gaming has a whole episode on that topic. But gaming, in a lot of ways, has imitated life. Way back in the early days of gaming, we had Skate or Die, which taught us old heads the difference between Goofy and Regular Foot. However, just like in real life, skateboarding disappeared from mainstream gaming until Tony Hawk landed that infamous 900 at the X Games, which kind of led Neversoft to landing a 900 of their own with the Tony Hawk Pro Skater series on the PlayStation 1 way back in 1999. In this very special mashup, we were going to talk about the ups and downs of skateboarding and video games for the last 20 years. So let's drop in. I did want to talk to you a little bit about Tony Hawk and some of the fun facts that you may or may not have known because I didn't know all. Before Neversoft and Activision brought us Tony Hawk, uh, they actually brought it to us because of the very limited success of Sega's Top Skater, an arcade game, and EA's licensed Street Skater. Activision wanted in on the action. They reached out to a developer and uh, once that developer brought them a skateboarding game, Activision was like, nope. Uh, and then that's when they reached out to Neversoft, who used a modded version of a previous engine that they used on the game Apocalypse. They actually used Sega's Top Skater as a big influence. They often even went to a local arcade at a bowling alley and played this game. And it actually inspired levels like Downhill Jam and the original mall, that downhill skateboarding. But they wanted to have a more visceral landscape and style to the game. And that is where Tony Hawk came in. Now, Tony Hawk was always a part of this series. He actually came in right before the release of the game, which I thought was very interesting. So let's talk about Tony Hawk. Why do you think Tony Hawk was an instant success? So I think it was an instant success because ultimately it was just different. I mean, you already had your baseball, your football, basketball games, but you didn't really have like skateboarding. And like you said, skateboarding in the 80s and 90s was kind of something... Some kids got into is like that anti, you know, rebelling type thing. And other kids like myself, we just in the servo, you had a skateboard. You couldn't do anything with it. But man, Tony Hawk hit that 900 and that thing was everywhere, man. I mean, the X, X games were just starting to kind of do something. So it really just kind of like was like, oh, wow. And then you get into the game and the game is so accessible. You know, it literally is one of those games that's easy to learn, difficult to master, but you felt like you were skateboarding. It was arcadey, which was at that time just kind of like the really what you were going to go for in gaming with the limitations of the systems. So, I mean, it just it just was awesome. Plus, man, I mean, I know you, you just kind of blew my mind telling me Tony Hawk kind of came in late in the process. But if you think about Tony Hawk, and I mean, like I know now social media is a big thing, but back in the day, Tony Hawk was like one of the few people, like if a celebrity was involved with gaming, that legit, you could tell, had a passion for the game. Like, it became, like, his second job. He skateboarded, and he made Tony Hawk games, and he was super into it. And I think that just resonated. Yeah, and it is one of those things that, uh, thinking back upon it, uh, he saw something that I think we all know now to be true. He, he actually played the game, and he saw that, hey, this is grabbing and mimicking the culture of what we do with skateboarding and he liked the realism of it this is back before motion capture they actually had to take videos of that x games 900 and redraw it mm -hmm. motion by motion for the game he saw that and i one of the things for me was this game you said it perfectly this game was easy to play but hard to master and i, I think that was one of the things that was very special about tony hawk because i even remember for myself playing it 
I would just go in there and, and rip up lines and just have a good time. And then I would go talk to my buddies and they're like, yeah, I scored, you know, a million points. Whoa, whoa you did what now? Yeah. Hold on. Wait a second. What am I missing here? Uh, so you kind of almost challenged each other and yourself to, to go for these uh, high scores. And like you said, it was just hard to master. And I know for me and the people I was around at that time, one of the things that I think lured a lot of us was that soundtrack. Because back then, man, you just kind of had your typical Zelda Final Fantasy type of, of, of sound to it. You didn't have this full on uh, soundtrack, let alone a popular punk rock ska music type soundtrack. Uh, was there anything about the soundtrack that lured you into it? Well, I think it was because, I mean, you know, in the 90s, man, when this game comes out, I think I'm 16, maybe 17. So that's the kind of music you're listening to. So it's right there. It's connecting with, like, the youth. And, you know, at that time, you got to think about gaming in the 90s, man, 1999. Like, yeah, there were some, you know, guys in their 20s and 30s playing. But most people back then, like, we, me and you, man, our age group was the group that kind of led gaming. So that hit us, like, this is the music we're listening to. And again, it wasn't like one song. It's an entire soundtrack. And that has kind of inspired throughout the generations to where now when NBA, you know, releases a new game or in the pre-release, same thing with Madden or even WWE, they talk about this is our song listing. You know, this rapper, you know, when Jay-Z did like the listing for NBA or The Rock picked the music for a WWE game, like it's a big part of gaming. I mean, in the 90s, at the most, you would get a CD that was inspired by a game. Like Duke Nukem had a music to kill by CD. And I think there were a few others, but Tony Hawk was like straight up, like you're playing this game and you've got this rock and soundtrack of songs you already like. So it just, it makes it like a seamless process. No, it really did. And then to that point, I mean, you've got to kind of think about all the things that Tony Hawk inspired over the years, you know, whether it is other skateboarding games or um, e even to that point, the soundtracks, I, I remember very, it being a very big point of one of the NBA games that, hey, Jay-Z did this soundtrack, Jay-Z did this soundtrack. And I don't think we would have had some of those things. Maybe we wouldn't have even had Rock Band if it wasn't for the uh, influence that uh, Tony Hawk had on the actual sound and soundtrack of music and video games. Uh, one of the other things that I feel like Tony Hawk did very well was its marketing and that infamous Pizza Hut demo. I mean, this really mm -hmm. put demos on the map, man. Do you remember this Pizza Hut demo? Dude, how could you not, man? Like... Do you remember if once your buddy got that demo and you tried it out, so you're like bugging your parents, let's get pizza, let's get pizza, and then you get the second disc or something, it's not the right demo. It's like, are you kidding me? But once you got it, man, because, you know, it kind of goes back to, like GTA 3 is another good example. Like nobody really knew what GTA 3 was until it launched and people started playing it. Nobody knew what to expect from Tony Hawk because skateboarding hadn't really been in you know the gamers hands in so long that when you finally got a taste of it and demos you know were such a cool thing anyway when we used to get a lot of demos but when you got your hands on this and it was like holy smokes man uh it just became fun because if i remember it was really only the like the two minutes on one level you got to do but it just became so competitive to get so good at that that man that game just became a i gotta get this game yeah, man, in a lot of ways, because this is, you know, again, talking about our preteen to teen years, and a lot of ways, man, I played that demo more than I probably played the original Tony Hawk because it was free. And it's like you said, man, you would have that one two minute run uh, at a level, and I believe it was the warehouse, and you just kind of like memorized that thing. You, you knew every, uh, every line, every gap, you knew, you knew where every skate was combo, you could hit it all. Speaking of that, I mean, what about, uh, I guess, Tony Hawk caught you? Because the gameplay is very different of what we have. Uh, skateboarding today i mean back then it was you had one level and you had a list of things to complete whether it was a high score catching those gaps collecting those tapes which by the way those tapes were actually i've read were actually inspired uh from super mario 64 and how uh, you collected the stars that's kind of the, the process yeah. of how the tapes got into the game and then you got the combo you know hit a combo getting all the letters and uh, collecting the uh, the skates like I talked about. I mean, were any of those things things that you liked or was there one that you liked more than the other? I mean, talk about the gameplay. So for me, it was, you know, it was the fact that, I mean, I can't go out there and skateboard, but I can feel like I can do it in this game. And then you're seeing these cool tricks. And, you know, you're, you remember building up your special just to hit that 900 because everybody wants oh. to do that. You know, oh, the, the combo was the big thing. I remember skate, or, I'm sorry, the tapes. Uh, but I remember those being, like, the really tough thing to find. Like, you had to hit the right jump to go smashing through a window to get it, you know? 
but the the actual combo letters I remember being the big thing and getting the high scores and I just remember sitting there and scoring like whatever points picking up my phone man back before cell phones to call my buddy's house and being like yo TJ I just scored 20,000 points on this level what you got and then him hitting me back an hour later like yo I just scored 21,000 points and it was like yo it was time to study but studying's going away cuz I'm getting into this game and I'm getting 22,000 like I mean it just became so competitive. It, it does. It, I mean, obviously, it helps. The gameplay itself was so addicting, and it was really part of that culture and that you know everything about it. But I mean, if that gameplay hadn't been so well done and that challenge, oh man, forget about it. I mean, that was just where it was at. Yeah, I definitely remember the first time I saw the combo. I was like, oh, okay, we're collecting the word skate, collecting the word combo. And then I realized that no, you have to hit all those combo letters and in, in sequence uh, and without uh, stopping a move set. Mm-hmm. I was like, what, 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 huh? The O's all the way over there. You know, uh, no, you, you could do it. You just had to uh, really figure out that level. But that, that just kind of shows that, you know, gaming at that time was just a, a different mindset and a different way of playing games. And you can really see that uh, Sega Top Skater influence of that very arcadic feel. Uh, did you have a favorite Tony Hawk level from the earlier days? Let's say Tony Hawk uh, Pro Skater 1 and 2. Or just in general, was there a favorite level? So I'm going to be honest because one and two, I mean, you're going back 20, 21 years at this point, and <laughs> it's, it's tough to nail down which one was in which. But uh, the warehouse from the first game always sticks out because, you know, what a lot of people doesn't re- don't realize about the first Tony Hawk, it, was, it wasn't like this open world game. You know, it was very much like two minutes per level type deal. So the warehouse was where you went when you just wanted to practice, just to have fun. Um, but the one that I remember like full level – it was the school, and I'm pretty sure that was Tony Hawk 2, but I just remember, like, having so much fun in that school, man. Um, what about you? Yeah, absolutely. So there was, uh, actually, because I'm a little bit more privy because I've been playing the 1 and 2 uh, remake. Uh, there was actually a school in both of them, but the iconic school was definitely the first level on Tony Hawk 2. Uh, I think it was actually titled School 2. Yeah. Um, that, that is definitely up there. Definitely, whenever I think of Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2, I think of that school. Uh, for me, if I had to pick a favorite, I would probably honestly go with the Chicago Skate Park from the original one. It was just something about that just felt grimy and just felt more realistic to uh, the, the skating scene at the time. So I really did appreciate that specific level, which kind of brings me into what is next, right? What came first, the chicken or the egg? It's hard to say, but one thing is for sure. Skateboard, skateboarding culture merged with pop culture in the early 2000s. Was it skateboarding culture or was it the success of Tony Hawk that did it? It is hard to say, but one thing is for sure. Tony Hawk was here to stay. We saw new competitors. Sony tried with Grind Session. Even Sports Network and ESPN tried with a a, a skateboarding game of their own. We even saw Thrasher Magazine take a stab at it. What none of us saw was coming was the extreme amount of extreme sports games that would follow. We had BMX. We had BMX XXX. We had snowboarding. We even had wakeboarding games. It was a different era. We had Tony Hawk every single year for at least a decade straight. Why do you think Tony Hawk was able to be so successful for so long? You got to think this is a time prior to Call of Duty, prior to Assassin's Creed, where we had skateboarding game coming out every year. Uh, 20 games over 20 years, over 20 plus platforms. Why? How could they hold on to that success for so long in your opinion? I think one of the big things is, as you said it right there, is there was so many competitors. You had wakeboarding and all these things. And by far, snowboarding actually ended up becoming the most popular. But it's because snowboarding is so closely tied, tied to skateboarding, if you will. But I think the thing is, is there were so many things out there to kind of show you, hey, this is it. We're doing it. We're doing it, too, that you would try it out. But they never hit that same level as Tony Hawk. Because Tony Hawk was just expertly made across the board. Yeah, and I, I don't necessarily disagree. I, I definitely love the BMX and wakeboarding games, and I definitely tried them out. But if they came out day and day with Tony Hawk, please, I'm playing some Tony Hawk. And, uh, you know, in those earlier days, uh, like I was saying, we had, you know, annualized releases. We had Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 through 4 uh, consecutive years. The game uh, kind of took a shift. Uh, you know, with any game, you kind of have to have a reason to buy it annualized this isn't a madden this isn't a uh nba where you can just update the rosters and have a new tackle style so tony hawk themselves had to find a way to keep you entertained but then we started to see a shift we had tony hawk underground followed up with tony hawk underground 2 which 
brought us more of a storyline and more of an open world style. Well, what are your thoughts and feelings of that shift? And what do you want to say about Tony Hawk Underground? Because personally for me, I love the shift. I remember th this is being real. When 3 came out, I dug through. Dude, I don't know if you remember this, but 3 had two of the coolest unlockable characters ever. They had Spider-Man, and you would sit there and like hit a move, and he would do like the web swinging, and then had Wolverine. And he would do like a, a full-on flip like in midair type deal. I just remember that being awesome. You know, I, got, I love Wolverine, you know what I'm saying? But the gameplay itself, I was kind of done with just the constant two-minute type deal. So when they go to 4... Four was like one that just, I mean, it hit me as hard as the original game because it was that semi-open world. Like it was more like hub world type, you know, playing. Uh, it started incorporating more skaters and skaters that I knew like Bam and Jera because Jackass was growing up or, you know, blowing up, if you will. Uh, and I absolutely love that style. So then when you go to Thug and you've got this awesome world with cool streets, like I think the first area is like a neighborhood. And it feels like if you were skateboarding in a neighborhood and you go to all these different areas, but the story is actually really cool. It's really good, especially in that time. And just in general, how many times do we get like really good storylines in a sports game? Uh, I, that hit me. I connected with it hard. I loved Tony Hawk Thug, Tony Hawk Underground. I mean, I thought it was great. Now, when you get to Thug 2 and you take that Bam and Jared and you bring in the entire Jackass crew, for me, it started just going a little too over the top. I said, I think Thug 1 is kind of for me where it peaked. And it was like, dude, Tony Hawk is just the masterpiece. Thug 2, where you included Jackass, like everybody in Jackass was in it. For me, it just started kind of, it kind of went over, man. And it started getting a little too of that silliness. I would say for me, uh, kind of the same thing. Around Tony Hawk Pro Skater 3, we were kind of at the, the for me, my maximum enjoyment of the arcade style. I was kind of getting over it. So when they introduced... Tony Hawk Underground, I think it was a perfect time because we did start to see those open world games, the Shimus, the Grand Theft Auto. So it was time, gaming culture was changing. We had more of a 3D environment. And I, I really think that Tony Hawk captured that at the right time. And I really enjoyed Thug, as we like to call it. And I think they did a great job with it. And I even think they did a really good job with Thug 2 when they started to introduce more of that pop culture, skating culture with the Jackass crew. Along the same time, EA, who had, I, I mentioned them prior, they had actually licensed this game called Street Skater. They didn't necessarily develop it. But with all the success, I mean, come on, man, Tony Hawk sold 1.4 billion copies. EA was like, hold on a second. I need some of this money. And they did a game called Skate. Now, Skate was a new era of skateboarding. This is something we hadn't seen before because it was an open world Tony Hawk. But it had that real life grit to it. It was as close to skateboarding as you could possibly get in a video game, even down to the camera angles. Where were you with skate? What did you feel about skate? Take us on that journey. Man, bro, I'm going to take you back in time. Me, you, Hulking Yoda from Lost at Sea Gaming that you can find on Anchor. We're in, I believe, we're going to see the new Resident Evil movie. Uh, somebody can figure out the timeline or whatever. And I remember posing this question to you guys guys if you can only get one whatever tony hawk was dropping that year or the new skate game what are you guys gonna get and i was all about skate to me it, like i said that jackass style of like over the top silliness like the gameplay like you said of thug 2 was phenomenal but it was that that silliness of it that just kind of i don't know man it went away from what i wanted to play but skate 2 it kind of went back to that culture part of skateboarding of like Hey, this is going to be about the skating. It's not about the everything else inside of it. It's about its own subculture. You know what I mean? Like, it's not just pop culture invading it. It's, hey, you're going to go to this school or wherever. Because if you remember, skate was kind of a pretty big map. And you're going to just learn how to do these tricks. And when you learn it, now you're going to go challenge these, tr you know, real professionals to something that was more realistic. Like, hey, can you own this spot? Which at that time was, you know, just getting the high score of it. And then you're going to try to compete to get in these magazine covers. It wasn't about like a world tour with the Jackass crew. It was something that genuinely felt like you could put yourself in there. You make your character and you're a real skateboarder. And those controls, man, me and you've talked about this a lot. Like a lot of games back in that time frame started using the analog sticks for, you know, whatever you did. I mean, even WWE was doing like the ultimate move controls. But I thought for skate, skate and probably like Fight Night were probably the best at using the analog stick that actually made you feel like 
what you were doing felt like what you would be doing in real life, if that makes sense. Uh, and Skate Man, Skate spoke to me, bro. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely every game back then was doing those. I believe even Def Jam did it, Tiger Woods did it, NBA did it, Fight Night did it. Some did it better than others, and I think Skate's uh, success with that was the fact that the analog sticks were really an extension of your feet. Now, but in not in a way that was just too over the top. You could still master it. It just took a little work. And I think that's what worked so well for Skate, especially in Skate 2 when they kind of meshed with that story-based, storyline, open-world vibe of a Tony Hawk. So I think that even then they did it very well. Now, I know Tony Hawk tried this uh, the year prior with Project 8. You know, they had a nail trick mode, which kind of changed it up. They just didn't really change the that extension of that foot with the analogs. And I know even that year to what you were saying, 2007, when skate came out, it was proving grounds, but I think it was just a little too late to course correct for Tony Hawk. You know, skate was here Uh, in skate two, which came out two years after the original skate. It was to me a masterpiece and just the way that they combined some of the best elements of Tony Hawk and the best elements of skate into one package. And I think they did it phenomenally well. What were your thoughts on skate two? And ultimately out of the skate one, two, three, which one was your favorite? Skate two. So, yeah, when the skate two drops, man, I'm loving it. Uh, it. There's just so much about it. You can get off the board. You can rearrange the environment in this game, and it's still the game that if I'm playing, wanting to play a skateboarding game, I load up the PS3 just to play Skate two. I just thought everything they did in that game was so well done. Now, let me be clear, because you kind of touched on it. The controls were not as forgiving as, say, the Tony Hawk games. Like, you know. X to jump over square, you've done a kickflip. In skate, you had to like pop it up just the right way, like down and up or up and down if you want to do a nollie. And then when you're in the air, you have to shift it a certain way to get it to, you know, do that trick. That was tough because I remember when the original skate came out, if you remember, there was two branches, Thrasher and Skateboarding Magazine. And I had finally accomplished one of the magazines and I got about a third of the way to get in the second one. And that was like the storyline, you know, and I got the red ring of death. By the time I got back to playing skate again after it was fixed and whatnot, bro, I was horrible at skate again. Like, it was that kind of challenge, uh, which I kind of imagine in real life, if you stop skating for an extended point in time, you're going to have a hard time getting back into it. That phrase you said earlier in the episode about Tony Hawk, easy to pick up, hard to master. This game was not easy to pick up, but yet was still hard to master. Absolutely. But it was, it was so, it was... It was almost like an internal challenge with it, man. You And I think that's what related to skateboarding. is Because if you watch anybody skateboarding, I mean, if they're just going to do a grind or an ollie or anything that seems very simple video game style, it takes a long time to master that. And you, it was translated so perfectly into skate that you actually were like bragging to your buddies, yo, I just did this massive grind, you know, this is insane. Even last year playing skate too, you know, when I was in Korea, I'd spent a lot of Sundays... And it would be like an hour of just like, I'm going to quote unquote own this spot. And it would literally just be grinding down a rail. You're not making this massive line. You're hitting a rail a certain way to get so many points. It just felt so real. And I think Skate 2 uh, just it, it upped the ante on so many things. No, I absolutely agree. And, uh, you know, one of the things that you did talk about uh, in regards to Skate 2 was being able to get off your board. This sounds silly uh, to probably most, but I think this is one of the things that really tells the history of skateboarding is that they often year after year would add something so small to the game mechanic that just meant a world of a difference, whether it was the manual, the revert, getting off your board. These type of things just completely changed the game and completely changed how you would do combos. And yeah, it, It's amazing to me that something so simple can completely change the game. And that's what they did year after year. I'll just say this, man. Two things. The manual in Tony Hawk 2 was game-changing. And in Thug, I remember I got my first ever million points off of just a manual. Like, that was so huge. And the funny thing is, man, I don't know if you agree with this or not, but it didn't matter if it was Tony Hawk or Skate. But when you got off the board, it's like the developers did not know how to program that well because it always felt so awkward running around, man. From there, uh, we did have, like I said, we had the, the kind of the downfall of Tony Hawk and the, the rise of Skate. You know, Tony Hawk's 900 was the trick heard around the world. After that, skating culture was here to stay. But at the same time, we saw the, the success of Jackass, which we talked about, and Bam Margera. We saw analyzed releases of Tony Hawk. And with those analyzed releases, we saw 
never saw off reaching those new ways to entertain us. And I think in a lot of ways, relied a little too much on that Jackass crew. We kind of saw them come to the forefront and Tony Hawk and the spirit of Tony Hawk kind of take that back seat. Now we have the worthy competitor of Skate. We will we saw Tony Hawk try to mimic it and the success of Rock Band and the over-realistic approach to the game and these new peripherals are taking over the world. We saw Tony Hawk really overcorrect. Uh, and I kind of wanted to talk about this because this isn't something that a lot of people talk about when it comes to Tony Hawk. It's almost the forgotten years. And that was with a game called Ride and Shred. It was a peripheral style game that you actually have a skateboard with infrared lights that you're trying to do s tricks on. And I think it was just a complete overcorrection to what Skate was doing with a realistic style skateboard. Did you ever try out these games? Do you have any thoughts on these games? No, I never tried it because if you remember, it was friggin' expensive, man. It was. Like, you had to buy the board, and then I get people say, well, Rock Band was the same way, and I think that's what they were more mimicking. They were trying to have that Rock Band style plus the skate. Like, oh, skate can do realistic, we'll show you realistic. But, I mean, if you just think about that in terms of technology, with a skateboarding game, like, all it would do is infrared is where your foot would pass. So it would kind of, like, show you skating and then kind of had some weight to where you would, like, you know, shift your weight to do a trick, but... Man, trying to do that on carpet or anything, nobody I knew that had it was impressed at all. And I remember, like, you would see the the promo videos of, like, the real-life skaters doing it and laughing, having a good time. But they're real-life skaters, man. You get average Joe on that thing trying to skateboard. Like, it's just not going to be good. It's going to be frustrating. And it kind of goes against the idea of uh, video gaming, where you just kick back and you relax. You're having fun, you know? But this game is like, hey, get off the couch, start doing this exercise. Like, I just don't think people dug it at all. And like you said, that's the key word. It was an overcorrection. It went so far away from what Tony Hawk was that you just couldn't sit there and enjoy it. And I think that really, really hurt it. No, I agree. I was one of those people who did have it. And it was one of those things that, look, man, I can't go skateboard, man. But now you're asking me to skateboard. I, I, it's a little far-fetched. And it just wasn't, I don't think it was technology that was really ready at the time maybe if they tried it today it would be a different story but it just wasn't very it was hard to adapt to it i guess is what i'll say you know at least with rock man i can't play a guitar but i mean we got three buttons on here and i can still sit on the couch the 360 and ps3 era i kind of think was the pinnacle of skateboarding if you really think about it and I, this really hit me hard when i was trying to do this episode with you is that skate was a game that even with all its success and uh, how well we touted, you know, even, you know, 10 plus years later, it all came out on one generation. We yep. saw skateboarding peak and disappear almost in one generation. It, it is wild to me. This generation in the early days, we had Tony Hawk Pro Skater 5, which was a like cell shaded weird version of Tony Hawk. It was awful game. I absolutely did not like it. And all of a sudden now, we have this dead space, no skateboarding. Until this very year, it seems like they got the memo. We want skateboarding back. We have new contenders. We have sessions. We have Skater XL. We have an announcement of Skate 4. Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 and 2 Remade came out. Well, let's talk about it, man. Uh, these games are so differing, in my opinion. Tony Hawk 1 and 2 Remake is just that. It's the originals with today's technology. Looks phenomenal, but it's still the same game. Then you have the announcement of Skate 4, but then you have Sessions and Skater XL. And I don't know if you've ever played either one of these games. These games are as real as going out and skateboarding. They are pretty intense, man. Whereas Skate was kind of an extension of your, your feet, and you can kind of learn it. Like, this is like, yo, this is your feet. It is hard to play. What are your thoughts? Hey, man. Uh, so I'm going to be honest with you, man. Like, Sessions, I'm a PlayStation player, so I can't play it. Skater XL drops, and... I was super stoked about it, but here's the thing. Like you said, man, they went for that ultra-realistic style, you know? And I think on, you know, you're gaming with Mr. C channel on YouTube, man. You actually go through sessions, and you're holding the controller, and you're showing all the different ways you have to, you know, do stuff and how just complicated it looks. Like, it looks like it can't be fun unless you are just, like, that into skateboarding. You're willing to, you know, mimic it with your hands. Uh, set, uh, Skater XL? It looked like it was pretty similar to that, but then people were basically saying, hey, this is the game you play in a skateboarding game while the actual skateboarding level loads. Like, there's no objectives. It's just go skate in this area. 
So they almost seem like that free to play style or that beta release or whatever. So it just there was never anything appealing other than the fact of, well, this is as close to his new skate game as I'm going to get. Part of it is because it feels like, hey, grab your skateboard and go outside without going outside. It's a little too realistic. It's almost like they forgot that it's a video game. Exactly. I haven't played the Tony Hawk, um, the remakes uh, for one and two yet. I actually really do, especially the more we talked about, you know, going to this episode. Uh, and I think it's just a callback. My only issue with those is because, bro, we talked about it. We played those games out, man. And you talk about it, you know, on your show. And you talked about it with me. Like, it just, it's like we know those levels so much that it's, it's cool. It's going to be new. But, like, I almost feel like it's not as fresh as it probably is for some of these people that didn't play that game 20 years ago. But if I'm looking in the future, man, I'm telling you, I am so excited for Skate 4. I hope it just retains. I hope they don't try to evolve it too much like just give us that core gameplay nail an open world that's fun give us we don't need like a thug storyline even though thug was amazing with its storyline we just need a reason to be playing the game make it the controls fun i'm there man i'm so there i cannot wait for more info about it what about you like what is you know same same question to you what do you think about uh tony hawk and skate and then even like i mean i think you've talked about sessions but what do you think about the future games coming out no absolutely and i love skateboarding games and i'm willing to give any of them a, a, a shot or try them you know tony hawk one plus two the remake if you will i liken it to having beer goggles it's the same thing but now everything just looks awesome and pretty and that's how i feel about it because i lived through tony hawk i, I was there pretty much on day one i didn't necessarily need that experience i think it is great for nostalgia region it's a good price it's good for new gamers I'm just really hoping that they're just reminding everybody, hey, Tony Hawk was there. We created this culture. And I'm hoping that they're going to try their hand at a new style of thug in the future. I don't know. It would be very nice if they did. I know that Neversoft really isn't a company anymore. So I don't know who's going to take that challenge on. As far as Skate 4 goes, I am there day one. Um, I would hope for more of a Skate 2 style. Uh, than a Skate 3 style, but I will take any version of Skate because I do think that that game was that impactful, and I do really appreciate that game. That being said, I mean, what is your favorite skateboarding game? So my favorite one I go back to, I talk about how I'm loving it so much, it's got to be the original Underground Thug. I just, from the storyline you had in the game to, you know, the world, like, I just really enjoyed it. I had a ton of fun with it. Uh, what about you? Believe it or not, man, and this is going to probably sound a little wacky to me, the one that is the favorite of mine that I just think back to with the best memories is American Wasteland. And I know that I feel like that was kind of the collapse of Tony Hawk, but just in that time period of my age and that culture, like that American Wasteland captured every moment of that. And it came out at the launch of the 360, which is already exciting. So, Because there was a really cool feature about uh, American Wasteland where I think they were trying to appeal to everybody that gets lost in the shuffle is... If I'm not mistaken, that was that open world style gameplay, what we had seen, you know, the year or two prior, but it also incorporated where you could go back and play it the old school style of getting the combos and like doing the lines and stuff like that. And if I'm not mistaken, that was the first Tony Hawk game that they built with the idea that, hey, you could do a line from one end of the level to the other. So there were some good merits to, you know, American Wasteland. It's just the best. It's just that's one I look back with the most fondest of memories. But speaking of the best, which one do you... Th Before I get into the best, let me ask you this. What is your favorite style Tony Hawk game? Was it the pro skater style? Was it the open world serious style? The open world over the top? Or the peripheral style? What was your favorite Tony Hawk style? So, I mean, it would be very easy for me to say Thug because it had that story and everything. But at the same time, man, I think that... Tony Hawk 4 had a nice blend where you had missions to do or objectives or whatever to complete, but the game was still all about the skateboarding. You know what I mean? Like, you go to this hub city or whatever, and it was just about skateboarding around until you went to somebody and they said, hey, I got this challenge for you. And it was a very realistic challenge at the time. So I would probably say it's it's a borderline between that style and when they incorporated the story of Thor, so uh, of Thug. So for me, 4 and Thug were like, I mean, those were ama two amazing back-to-back -back years of, of Tony Hawk games. What about yourself? That is definitely the thug style. The open world, kind of serious, has a story. Um, you know, didn't take itself too seriously. wasn't too 
uh, definitely, definitely the thug style. Uh, which kind of brings me into before we again before we get to the uh, the big one here. What was your favorite style of skateboarding name? Was it the Tony Hawk arcadic style? Was it the Sessions Skater XL overly realistic style, or was it skate? Because I feel like skate is kind of in between those two. It kind of takes the arcade and mix it with some realism. What 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 would you say is your favorite style? Oh, it was absolutely skate. I mean. The cool thing I always think about skate, and this is this is kind of a good pitch between skate and Tony Hawk. Tony Hawk, you ride up, you hit X, you hit triangle, and you've grinded. With skate, man, you got to ride up, you got to ollie just right, and then you can actually maneuver your board while you're grinding to, you know, hit that different type of grind. And I just, I love skate, man. The style of skate, that's easily my favorite. I, I got to pose that same question to you. No, it is actually skate as well. And there's, a for I think, a lot of reasons. You know, skate is one of those things that if you put an hour into that game, you're good after that. You're going to appreciate the game. And it's an extension of yourself. It's got a very good vibe to it. Uh, sometimes to me, man, Tony Hawk is a little too fast-paced, a little too easy. And I, I just think skate hits that mix, man. I'm going to be honest with you. And maybe after playing sessions for three or four hours, maybe I would feel the same way, but... That first two hours of sessions was brutal for me. So I really definitely think it is Skate. Um, so I'm very, very much looking forward to a Skate 4. If they call it Skate 4, they might call it Skate Quattro. Uh, yeah. But uh, let me ask you this, man. The, the question of all questions. What today in 2020 do you think is the best skating game? If somebody's never played a skateboarding game, which one should they play? I, I absolutely still have to go with Skate 2. I think it just had, it brought so much to it. It was new. Like you said, you invest an hour in the game and you're good and you're still going to be learning and you've got the basics and there was so much to do. Uh, I would have to say skate too. What about yourself? Hands down, unequivocal, without even thinking about it. When you asked me this question a week ago when we first started talking about this episode, I already knew it was skate too. No, there's just no questions asked because again, it just, was the perfect mix of everything and I, I think they did it so well and still to this day it, uh, you know it's very beloved by me i occasionally pull up skate three on my xbox one and be like man i wish this was skate two um, exactly. so this is pretty much the history of skateboarding games from pretty much 2000 to 2020 uh so over 20 years of skateboarding history Let's see gaming with this to see to see to see Gaming with Mr. C. 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 Gaming with Mr. C.